Let's do this, brother. <laughs> hello, 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 world. This is Shruti Pandey and new year, new beginnings uh, with new kind of an energy. And it's an honor and it's uh, another level of happiness to host uh, a brother across many, many seas and oceans. So here is Jay who has a very similar journey, career journey as mine. There's testing you will find on his profile. You will see he's a founder, he's a podcaster. So the the last time we spoke, when uh, he invited me to his podcast and I was like, are you sure? Like, why? Why me of all the people? And he was like, why not you? So it, it was one of the best podcasts or it was one of the best conversations other way around I was have, having last year. So thank you for that, Jay. And I'm so happy for you because your progress, your success makes me happier. And this guy, he loves his family. Uh, there's a baby on the way and his love and passion for astrophotography is another level, like literally into the space or astro. So <laughs> let's get into knowing Jen <laughs> more. I hope I introduced you all right. I think you gave me too much credit on everything. Uh, it's very nice to be with you again. You are, I think we hit it off like, I think we hit it off through the messaging. Like we just kind of connected through LinkedIn, just like messaging. And then we met in person and we're like, wow, we were like, kindred uh spirits i think so thank you for being on my show and thank you for the beautiful introduction so thank you very much i'm glad to be here i'm so i'm just glad to talk to you again this is great <laughs> and i think it was literally like like you rightly mentioned we first spoke before like literally during the recording or a little bit before the recording of the podcast and after that we just spoke after the recording i think longer <laughs> compared to the podcast yes and it was one of the best conversations really Aww. and uh, i think uh, when you have such a connected doesn't matter how far you are or oh we didn't catch up again but this conversation feels like we just picked up again from where we <laughs> so, yeah so, that's that's a good that's the you know the the sign of a good friendship right as you just pick pick right up where it left off so yes i feel like we didn't miss a beat we're back we're back and uh, i want to understand while i was talking all glory about you and you were like oh my god this is too much but from testing to becoming a founder to becoming a podcast host yourself like what really pushed you or got you started into you know getting started uh, with your own business what was that adrenaline or madness or craziness like why living a good life earning good money testing is not that bad <laughs> testing is great in fact but why why I become a founder um you know i typically blame my wife for that um i think with any good partnership um you push the other person and um, you kind of bring out the best in them. And I was, you know, I was doing fine. And I was, I mean, at the time I was, uh, I thought I was living my dream. I was, I finally got to be a video game designer. That's what I was like, went to school for. And I was like, I was really, and it wasn't for like a big, you know, studio or anything, but it was, it was really fun and I enjoyed it. And I got to make games and I got to talk to customers and like do all the stuff. Um, but spoiler alert, uh, the game industry sucks. They don't pay a lot of money. They it's a tough cycle. Um, you know, if uh, if a, if a product or a game doesn't do well, then it doesn't do well. There's not much you can you can do about it. You can't fix it. I mean, you can, I guess, nowadays with all the patches and updates and stuff. But back then, uh, if it was a you know if nobody enjoyed it, then it was just you know a bad game. So uh, wasn't making a ton of money. Um, got an offer to go do QA at a healthcare company. My wife said, well, we have another baby on the way. You probably should kind of weigh the, the salaries and kind of figure out what to do. Um, and so she kind of pushed me out into that. And then um, she was a nurse or she is a nurse uh, overnight. Uh, she doesn't work overnight anymore, but she used to work at these really crazy long-term care facilities for kids. And it was like a really tough job. And like, she was pregnant, like working overnight. And it was just like this, awful kind of situation and um i really wanted to figure out how do i squeeze more hours out of the day how do i make more money in the same amount of time so i was I, my favorite my kind of famous thing that i talk about on all the podcasts 
uh, is that I got rejected by Uber okay. because my license was from another state because I moved here from Virginia to Pennsylvania and I couldn't do Uber. I couldn't do Lyft. So I was like, I couldn't even get like the job that everybody gets to make extra money. Like I was trying anything. Um, and I found Upwork online one day by searching for QA contracts. And uh, that was the beginning. Then I grew that business through Upwork. And I think it really became a business um, when I finally was able to hand work off to somebody else. And I, you know, somebody came to me and wanted me to do the job. And but I could kind of tell that maybe this was my op my opportunity to have somebody else do the work for me and kind of be the, the middleman. Um, and once that happened and, and I realized I could pay somebody else, you know, 25 an hour, they were going to pay me 50 an hour. So I made $25 an hour doing nothing, quote unquote. Um, the light bulb went off and I was like, oh, this is this is how the world works. This is how everybody makes businesses. So that was the beginning. And um, yeah, I, I traditionally blame my wife for that, uh, who is now starting her own business uh, and getting plenty of, uh, you know, solicited and unsolicited advice from me. I've learned to not give the unsolicited advice and just be the sounding board. But uh, I'm very happy and kind of proud of her for, you know, her going on her own journey now. So so it's kind of come full circle. So I, I hope once she is back with the baby and all of both of them are healthy and fine. Maybe one day I'll be interviewing her as well. Yes. Her business. Yes. I but told her I'm going to have her on my podcast. The first customer I have to have her on for sure. And I'll, she, I'm sure she would love to meet you and be on. Absolutely. I respect that. And it's such a great journey to your your side of story even more uh, this time. And while you, you were mentioning a lot of these things about, you know, money and stuff. It's, it's weird because, you know, in India, we see, okay, we come from, there are different classes. There's lower class, there's middle class, there's upper class who are like the richy rich. And we we all also like, you know, struggle. And every time we think of uh, US, it's like, oh, there's money, there's like dollars, there's everybody's like Uncle Scrooge probably. And, you know, it's it's not really like that. No, it's not. Really like that for everybody. So or anybody, I, I think it's just the one person of the world who, anyways, it's it would get into another conversation. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'll leave it for some other day. But this is this is crazy, and I I love the hardworking spirit of the both of you, uh, and uh, I appreciate the fact that you appreciate your wife, and you know sometimes pressing buttons or pushing is not seen as a good sign. It could be like, oh my god, my partner is right. boxing, <laughs> I can't take. Yes. And uh, we we live in a environment and society and world which is so fragile where relationships and marriages end. So I just hope that you guys are always, always this blessed and happy. And uh, while you started off this journey with Upwork, I want to understand one thing because I know a lot of people in India who are listening to this conversation um, always have this one fear ever since the pandemic at the back of their head that moonlighting and how do I handle it so did you also do a little bit of that while you're working at some place and you oh, start yeah. working oh yeah how did you manage that like is it a battle is it, is it like a conscience thing it, is it like a, oh my god my employer would know and terminate the actual job how is it um I will say that I don't miss that phase of life for sure. It was very, you know, it wasn't intense, but it was, um, it's tough to come home and then work again. <laughs> I mean, that's really what it is, you know, it's like, and then as I kind of picked up more contracts, I always had a full-time job, which, which I, I always kind of recommend, like if you can, if you have the motivation to start your own business, I highly recommend you keep your nine to five job and you just, figure out how to slot it into your break time or your before work or after work or, you know, your lunch break or whatever it is, because it just, it's such a de-risked way to, to start. I mean, to just jump out. I mean, good God, it gives me anxiety just thinking about it, just like jumping out of like, you know, you're having nothing and just going and doing it, which I mean, is part of your journey, which is crazy. Um, and, you know, that's a different level of, you know, fortitude to do that. I don't, I mean, I, I don't think I could do that. So I, I always tell people and even people that come to work for us part-time, I'm fine with them having other, I prefer they have other jobs. Cause like, 
I want them to be stable. I want them to be consistent. I want them to, you know, whatever. So yeah, I was, I mean, at one point I was answering calls in the stairwell on my break and like, you know, I was doing Slack stuff on lunch breaks and, you know, doing what, and it was, I always feel like I gave my employers hundred percent. I never cheated them of hours. I didn't like do stuff at the same time or whatever, but you know, I, I used my time wisely. And I mean, I had three or four or five or six contracts running at the same time while having a full-time job. Um, in office, right, which is even crazier to think about. Um, but then when I moved moved to a fully remote nine to five position, things became easier, more flexible. I was able to hop on calls, do whatever I had to do, and um, you know, just just I, I always, I'm sure there are employers that will crack down on that and not appreciate you having other jobs. I think you just have to find out if they're okay with it or not. I mean, if they're not, and <laughs> First of all, if they're not, I don't know if that's a place you want to work, right? If they're like, no, you can't work somewhere after hours. Like, I mean, that's not your time. That's not their time to tell you that. But I'm not sure how that is in India, if it's any different. But uh, I would say traditionally, most people, most companies in America, you know, besides maybe like enterprise, big, you know, massive companies don't have a problem with you moonlighting um, as long as it's not during work hours. I, I think here there would be like cultural and geographical and okay Silicon Valley of India and that kind of perception or because here it's like how much can we slog how much can you squeeze out of these people and right. make 70 hours a week or 80 90 hours a week so there really is no time left you know mm. I have sometimes or oftentimes people asking me like just have me on some of your projects and let me do the part-time thing. But they don't have their life, their, their time, and there's all, already that work. And I I mean, I, I say them no with a heavy heart because it's not going to work, right? It's, it's going to get difficult. Plus, the employer situation is very, let's say, toxic here. You can't do that kind of a thing. If they get to know... It would reflect on your resume very badly. And I wanted to ask you also about what about the people who just take the plunge? Like for me, I mean, despite getting offers, I'm like, no, I'm just tired of this thing and get into another cycle. But I got your answer with that one word and she is so <laughs> moving on. I want to now understand uh, how did you get your first 10 customers? Like when you officially started your JDAQA firm, how did you first get your first 10 customers? First 10. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a whole podcast in and of itself, right? You could be <laughs> the first 10 customers instead of the first customer. Um, I think ma mainly through Upwork. Uh, there was a couple referrals. One of them is still a client today. And probably our biggest sales person is that company because they're a well-known name in Philadelphia and everybody knows who work at them. And um, uh, so the first 10 most were Upwork, I think, um, which, you know, was still a lead generation source for us today. It's not our, we used to rely on that. That was it. That's all we did. And then honestly, I think when the Ukraine war happened and they cut off all the Russian contractors, all the Russian businesses, all the Russian agencies, everything was just cut off. We didn't do business over there, but it's certainly woke me up a little bit and I said, well, that would suck if that happened to me. If they just, I went in one day and my account was gone. So I kind of pivoted, started to run, real, figure out how to run a real business um, and, you know, lead generation, you know, marketing, sales, doing all these things, networking, going to business events, conferences, all that stuff. So the first 10 were probably mainly through Upwork, but um, there were certainly some that were just like, you know, uh, some guy knew I did QA and was like, hey, you know, are you still kind of consulting doing QA? Like maybe you could help our company out. And it's just from, uh, you know, letting your network, I guess the the answer there is letting your network know that you're doing consulting. And again, I don't know in India, um, <clears throat> I don't know if India, if that's like possible to like let your network know that you're consulting if, you know, you have a nine to five job. Um, but people know that I was doing that and they, they reached out. So yeah, I, I mean, Upwork's a cheat code uh, for running a business, I think. Um, it's very competitive. It's a different landscape now than it was 10 years ago. But, you know, I think there's still still some opportunity for people. Um, and we could get into that whole thing. But my, my main message about Upwork is do not 
play the race to the bottom game. You know, it's very much a who's the cheapest, who's the whatever. But if you can get on there and prove you have some skills that are worth more than somebody else is charging less, then people will probably hire you. So, I mean, don't sell yourself short and just try to go as low as you can. Now, does that mean you can charge, you know, $500 an hour because you think that's what you're worth? Probably not, right? But, um, you know, don't go too low thinking you have to compete with everybody else who's bidding and doing all this other stuff. Just go in there and, and you know, kind of put a profile together and, and let people know what you're worth. That that makes sense because yeah, I think the first time I opened up Upwork, I was like anxious looking at, oh my God, there are so many people around the world. And while you're interviewing, while you're getting hired at a place, that's exactly what happens with you. You just don't know. Right. It's everything is one to one with you and the company. But when when at Upwork, and I, I love that advice because yeah, it feels like okay, as much as low you would go, it would be better for the employers to, you know, have your attention and get you the money and get you the job but I don't think so like what's the point of leaving all that rat race getting into consulting only to lower lower, right. lower your game it doesn't make yeah. any sense so okay they're usually not the great clients either by the way the clients that are trying to get as cheap a work as possible mm -hmm. are typically not the best clients to work with yeah those are the ones that are pinching pennies those are the guys that will dispute all your hours and you know try to like nickel and dime you to death but like you know if you have a client that's willing you to pay a decent rate and they are a good company then so it's it's kind of twofold like don't sell yourself short but also mm. don't work with companies that are going to undervalue your time because they're probably going to be cheapskates wow yeah that's a life lesson right there yeah <laughs> <laughs> that is certainly a life lesson yes yes it, it definitely fits everywhere it is and while you have been on this journey and right and I, I now know for sure after two years of freelancing consulting and taking that mad, mad jump that, I mean, I have another level of respect for people who do this kind of stuff, right? And I'm glad you had the opportunity that you could s start something parallelly, which I or many people in India can't afford to do, luckily, unluckily. But I know this journey is not easy. And coming to the question, which I have, my final one is... What still keeps you motivated or going like, okay, I, I I can't give up now. I have to take this, this baby, this corporate, this firm, this organization, this company of mine to another level. What keeps you going now? I just keep having babies, man. I got to pay for all of them. I guess that's the answer. Um, no, not really. Uh, I do struggle with that sometimes. And I think the older you get, the more philosophical you can be about that answer, you can go, well, what's my purpose in life in general? Like, am I doing, am I spending the very, very, very short amount of time I have on this earth doing the things I want to be doing? Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, it, it comes and goes and it's definitely back now. And we we're talking a little bit before the show about kind of the ebbs and flows of, of, just life and, and uh, being a founder and a business owner and all these things. And it's, you know, it's the picture of the guy on the billboard that you think of and you see it, he's just like this motivated guy, just constantly going and doing it. But like there's, there's ups and downs and there's dips and there's valleys and there's peaks and all that stuff. So um, I think at, at different times, different things motivate me. I mean, obviously I'm a dad of soon to be six, which um, just saying that out loud, I think keeps me motivated um, you know, I got to put kids through college. I got to keep them having a good life, um, support everything they do. But the, the second piece to that is we've genuinely built, um, a really good team and a really good group of folks that like I genuinely care for and I love very much. And I like treat them like family. Um, I know that's like a very like cliche thing to say as a business owner, but like I genuinely, everybody has a seat at the table. Um, nobody is less important than anybody else. Um, so I think, you know, especially like, you know, the people have been with me for a long time. Like, I think I owe it to them to keep pushing forward. Like, I mean, at any point I could just shut down and go work somewhere else or do whatever, but like, that's not, I don't think that'd be fair to them. I don't think, I don't think that's the type of person I am. I wouldn't be fair to my family. So, um, you know, I, I, it, it's a great question and I don't have a clear answer for it as I, you could tell for the rambling I just did, but it's, um, it's, uh, 
I like running a business. I love it. I want to keep doing it. I love the freedom that it brings. Like I spend a lot of time with my kids, uh, especially my daughter, the my one and a half year old. Um, the baby is just like. Uh, I, I probably spend too much time uh, with her. Like, I, I mean, just so much time. But I think the more kids I have, the older I get, the more I realize, like, they're, they're, they're little for a very, very short amount of time. Like, super, like, they're not going through these phases where they're, like, learning to walk and learning to talk and learning to write and read. And, like, that stuff doesn't last forever. So, like, the flexibility... Um, that I have while still being able to, to bring in clients and like make sales and like do podcasts and talk to awesome people like you, like that flexibility, I think is what keeps me going. I don't have like this big shining, like purpose or like motivating thing at the, you know, that I think is like the, the general consensus that you should have. Um, I just enjoy liking what I do every day. And liking the people I work with and getting to pick and choose what I get to do. So I think the freedom and the flexibility, maybe that's the, maybe that's the answer. I think you answered everything. I might have shocked you a little with the question, but but you you really managed to forget about the general consensus, right? We are not here for the general consensus, but you spoke from heart and you spoke about the real things. And the, the moment you started with the philosophical part, I was like, this is the reason why I call you brother. <laughs> because, yeah, <laughs> yes. And well, you, you, to be fair, you did offer me, you offered me the questions beforehand. And I said, I'll figure it out when we get yeah. there. So you did shock me, but that's, that's on me. That's uh, you, you gave yeah. me the chance to, to preload it. I, I am kind of happy, you know, I was like, I, I have the ability to do that to a person who who really appreciates me as another human being. That That's not every day, right? So I'm happy. <laughs> good. Then I've served, then my goal is complete for today. I've made you <laughs> happy and I'm good to go. But that, does that also make you anxious thinking about your kids and, oh my God, what will happen to their future and stuff like that? Like a parent. No, I'm not an anxious person, really. I don't. Oh. I don't, I don't know where that comes from. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are very anxious people. Um, I mean, I really, and it drives my wife crazy. I think I don't worry about things until they're a problem. And then when they're a problem, then I'll, you know, I'll worry about them and deal with them like a normal person. But in between, like, I have so many hobbies. I have so many kids. I have so much, so many people awesome people I get to work with like problems I get to solve all day every day I don't I don't know I don't I mean even if we like lose a big client or like the other day I woke up I, we it was eight o'clock at night and they said uh my my team came to me and said our Upwork account got suspended and I was like well that's not good right I mean that's like their entire you know a huge funnel of business for us that we get leads from all the time and we and then and I think more anxious people would have probably lost their minds, right? I mean, if, if you really think about like how core that is to our business, yeah. I probably should have lost my mind. But um, I just don't operate that way. I don't, uh, I mean, sure, I freak out and like, I'm, you know, I have moments and like my kids will tell you, like you know, they can push my buttons and you know, whatever. But from a, a long distance standpoint, I typically just, try to live in the moment and like things will that doesn't mean i don't plan i don't try to get ahead of things but uh it doesn't do any good to worry about stuff that's not happening right now like my kids are going to be how my kids are going to be my kid you know they're going to if they want to go to college they're going to go to college if they want to be do whatever they're going to do whatever like i i'm going to push them towards certain things um but i really don't worry about it i just don't see the the it doesn't do me any good it's a waste of time Good. It's a, so that's it that's the best thing you could do as a boss or as a head or if you run your business like a family that's the best thing you could do as a father figure right because if everybody is paranoid anxious and stressed and if you just add to their misery it's not going to help either right. your founder's journey or it's your kids who has made you this or it's your age <laughs> let's blame it on that as well it's all the above for sure. But this is actually great. And uh, yeah, why worry for things? And just yesterday, I don't remember who I said this to, but you know, you, while you're talking about all the mountains and valleys and everything, there's ups and downs. Uh, 
I don't remember who said this to me or where I read it, but I said this yesterday to someone that if if you're dead, that life or that pulse would be like a straight line until right. and until life it will keep going. If you see on the machine in a hospital, yes. it's still a good. Yes. It means you're alive. So yeah, I love that. I but, love that. Yeah, <laughs> the EKG life, just up and down. I like that. That's good. It's it's life. If it goes straight, if it goes flat, you're dead. <laughs> right. And who wants to? I mean, who wants a flat, boring life anyway? Right. You can't. A, a bunch of my friends know very wealthy individuals, mm -hmm. and uh, I always think like the 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 ones who are born into that life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have all the things, and they have. But like, do they really appreciate any of it? Like, can you possibly know? how good things are if you haven't had to struggle and you don't know how bad things can be. Um, you know, so I, I try to look at it from a perspective of just appreciating knowing, you know, there's bad times and there's good times and really just try to enjoy the good ones while they're, while they're here. Yep. yep. I'm pretty sure they would have the different struggle of, Oh, daddy didn't get me the Prada. <laughs> or right. something like that. Yes. That's a different struggle for sure. Sorry. I think. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to uh, walk <laughs> rich, but yeah, that's their struggle. Right. The struggle to get food on plate or create the table. I think you would call it a superficial struggle. Yeah, so there, there's struggle for all of us, but oh my goodness, this conversation is so amazing. I don't feel like ending this, but I want to ask you two things. Okay. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this, but do you think I missed an, any question which you felt like I should have asked you or anything at all that you want to add? No, this is your show. Uh, you asked all the questions that you thought were great and I thought they were great. And uh, no, I love, I love talking to you. So um, no, I think you did a great job. Is there anything else that you would like the people who are listening to you, your journey, getting inspired or you know thinking okay let me start the moonlighting or let me become a founder or whatever whatever is going on in their heads given their struggles of life right we don't know what they are going through so do you have any advice for them um well two things one if anybody is listening to this and has any like reason to reach out to me please do linkedin my email, I'm sure we can put on this episode or whatever. Just reach out to me. I love talking to people. I love, uh, I'm a consulting evangelist. I love to tell people to go do it. And uh, if you ever have questions or thoughts or concerns and you don't have anybody to talk to about it, feel free to reach out. I love to to, to help with that stuff as much as possible. Um, and along that line, you know, they say that you are the sum of your five closest people. Um and I don't know where I picked up this like idea, but um, I have standing meetings every month with probably six or seven of my closest and most respected and people I admire uh, business owners. And we just talk and it's been the most helpful practice that I do. And I don't, you don't have, they don't have to be business owners. They don't have to be whatever but find the motivated people in your network in your life and talk to them regularly. And I think, you know, it'll make a big difference uh, in your mindset and kind of your motivation. And so just, just talk to other people. Don't be alone. And if you need somebody to talk to uh, you can find me on LinkedIn for sure. That's it. That's all I got. Sweetest and bestest advice <laughs> anyone could ever give. Yeah. I kind of like that idea of, Oh, God. I, I again hate it and I am again envious of the fact that you just hire people who are US based and I can't meet you in person, but you can, you can come here anytime. <laughs> we'll, we'll hang out. I promise you. You can come here too, but any... I could, I should, I should, we I will eventually. In the century, we, we can still meet this way. Yes. And it's, it's, it's always a pleasure and fun to know you chat with you, get a message from you or get just a sweet gesture. Okay, this is how you help me. 
and i really appreciate that honesty and you know that gesture of yours because i don't see that in many people left and i feel that because of some of the good people left on this planet is the reason why the planet is still spinning so that's true i think so uh, and i consider you one of those good people too and we should do a monthly meeting we should meet up every month we should not have a reason why we don't talk at least once a month right let's make that a thing let's do this yes all right okay. deal but you enjoy the rest of your day maybe take photographs of the moon because of your crazy love for astro photography and i hope when the baby arrives it's all more happiness added to everything <laughs> that's it thank you so much i appreciate you having me on you're the best ruthie thank you thank you